So first, I wanted to, to jump into the new album, The Owl. And mm -hmm. there, in addition to your drumming, there's also uh, the percussion done by Daniel. Right. And there's some programmed uh, uh, drum a lot of pieces. A lot of programmed stuff. In right. Fact. Yeah. So what I'm wondering is, you know, in that kind of album environment, how do you carve out your space? It's a very interesting question. And I think that there is no particular answer. <laughs> and, and I hate to be so vague and ambiguous about it, but it depends on the song. It depends on the the producer that you're working with, because we worked with several different producers on this. Uh, uh, so it depends on what their tendencies are. I mean, there was one tune that we did where we had the little zygote of the idea, the basics. Mm -hmm. We, as a band, we knocked out this really incredible backing track. It's uh, We all thought it was beautiful and in, in, in every possible way. It made you want to dance, it made you want to uh, did you want to get funky? Everything. It was, musically, it was so almost perfect for us, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then we send it off, and then it gets chopped up into little bits and processed and rearranged. And But that was the tendency of the producer. Okay. You know what I mean? So yeah. it had nothing to do with us. It had nothing to do with the, the, the song itself. It was just what the producer, where his mind was at creatively. Mm -hmm. um, and so... You know, when you're, as far as like riding between drums and percussion and and all of those little, and the electronics thing that's yeah. going on, it just, it's situational. It just depends on the song. Okay. Because you, ultimately we want the song to be served to the highest that it can be served. You yeah. know, we want, that's what we want. That's what we're going for. Right. But yeah, but, you know, with, with, the average band, you know, there's just the drummer, you know, right? Uh, uh, for the average album, you know, um, and so, you know, I found it interesting that you know, there's in the the field of percussion on this album, there's a oh. there's a lot of people joining in, you know, and yeah. so, um, what's the key also to learning how to play well with others, so to speak, play well with um, the percussion, play well with the electronics? I I think the biggest the, the 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 most helpful thing you can keep in mind for doing that is to to listen and to be aware and so for example when Daniel's playing sometimes he'll play a part you know and that part will just for whatever reason catch the ear of whoever's in the in the booth and go oh yeah why don't we make that into the loop mm -hmm. and then everything gets deconstructed and reconstructed around this loop and so, you know, in that kind of context, you want to just listen and, and, and give space to those ideas that as they come up. Mm -hmm. In a live context, you know, when you have a track going that's got a lot of these electronic elements in it, um, and then Daniel has what he's going on, you know, what he's got going on, that maybe he's playing a part from the record, maybe he's playing an additional part mm -hmm. that's an embellishment. Yeah. And so, from my perspective, my job is to hit the high points, hit the like the strong beats, mm -hmm. um, embellish where I can, but pretty much be aware and listen to and be open to what's happening musically with the electronic end of things, mm -hmm. and what's happening with Daniel's end of things. Mm -hmm. um, so if he picks up a shaker and starts playing an intricate pattern, then I am more than likely going to lessen what I do on the hi-hat since there's similar sounds. Mm. And so I let that, you know, I, I defer to him. Yeah, it's like, you know, out of love, you know, for the music and of, out of love for him, mm -hmm. you know, because he's, you know, he's an incredible player and masterful musician in his own right. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to take away, I don't want to detract from what he's doing. Yeah, but and, and also I think that brings up a, a great point of lack of ego in the sense that, <coughs> There are a lot of musicians with egos and who who fight for the limelight and fight for the attention, you know, in this world. And so it's really cool to hear yeah. that at the level you guys are at, and you know, amazing experienced musicians, 
sometimes the best thing you guys do is just pull back a little and like, all right, take yeah. you take it from here, and then I'll come well, back in later. And you know, if you if we have an idea, if somebody has a musical idea mm -hmm. that they really strongly believe in, then they're gonna they're gonna say something. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So like, if Danny has a beautiful idea that he really feels strongly about and feels like it needs to be an integral part of the song, then he'll speak up and say, hey man, I'm doing this thing, it's really kind of cool. I would appreciate it if you would help me to bring it to the forefront, bring it to life. Mm -hmm. And same thing, in the other direction, I'll say, hey man, I'm really thinking like, this is this groove's gonna work, help me to help me to, to, to state this in the way that we, we wanna state it. And, mm -hmm. and so that's what we do, you know, we work together. And we try to do that as a band, you know, mm -hmm. so, for example, if Coy has a, a guitar riff that he's really feeling is really adding to the song, yeah, then he will say, hey, guys, I'm, I've got this guitar thing. I think it's really cool. We should explore it. Mm -hmm. And we do. Yeah. You know, you try to be, if you can serve the song, then you can, you have to be willing to do it without ego, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And then another thing I'm curious about, because... Um, there are a lot of bands, great bands, where they're kind of always playing at the same level, even if it's a ballad, even if it's, you know, there there's like uh, some harder rock bands where everything is just an intense force. With you guys, you know, one thing I've really picked up on listening to a lot of this stuff, especially on this album, is, you know, Zach's voice gets really like whisper quiet at times. Yeah. And then it really, you know, will ramp up to where he's fully projecting. And that can happen all within one song yeah. and I'm curious how often is what you're creating based on his vocal lead well it depends on whether or not we have that part of the arrangement of a song worked out first mm -hmm. or if that comes second you know because in the process of creating for a record or, or you know an album if you will, whatever yeah. I'm showing my age. You know. <laughs> so you're creating. Hey, I bought the vinyl. With yeah, this, with exactly. This album, so so. Like you get, so you're you're creating this collection of songs, and you know, and even that's kind of changing in, in modern music. But you've got this collection of songs, and some of them will be written and fleshed out completely ahead of time before you go into the studio. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, or you know, the writers will know. This is what we want. This is how it's going to be laid out. This is, this is what we're going for. Mm -hmm. This is the song. And there are other circumstances where you have this little idea, and you've got a hook, and you've got some lyrics, and it's not completely fleshed out, but you know the idea is a good one, and then you just like I call it a I call it a baby zygote of a song, <laughs> you know. So you bring this little zygote of an idea, and you hope to cultivate it into this beautiful, living, breathing thing that is a song mm -hmm. and and so so every bit of it like there's a lot that gets created around this one little seed of an idea and there's some things where you have like the big chunks of the song and you know that they're going to go and you know that they're going to work in a certain order in a certain way mm -hmm. and then you get you get it all done and maybe you, you start mixing and you get in post-production and you think man what if like maybe we shouldn't do the bridge there. Maybe we should move the bridge here and like let's cut out a chorus. Yeah. But you still want that organic curve to happen. You know, you want that ride, that emotional ride, mm -hmm. or at least we do. Yeah. We want for there to be uh, an emotional response that goes from, you know, goes up, it comes down. It's it's an organic curve. Mm -hmm. It's what, in my opinion, makes all music. Uh, a beautiful living breathing thing you know and you can even apply that to like EDM it, so it sounds crazy but hmm. you go I wouldn't have guessed that All so right. if you go to an EDM <clears throat> like a, a big concert rave yeah. whatever it is you know and you've got the the DJs rocking <laughs> oops, 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 you know what I mean and they're they're rocking the beat and they're doing their thing and there comes a point where things start to drone and mm -hmm. you can feel this intensity building up and it's a lot like the way James Brown would have his band riff and riff mm -hmm. and riff and you would think it's like this and you think it's not going anywhere yeah. and it's oh no there's the pulse and you feel that tension building and then all of a sudden they drop the bass in the EDM music and the place goes completely nuts mm -hmm. you know and so there's that organic energy curve mm -hmm. happening and it's, it has to do with dynamics and 
energy and intensity of energy and intent. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's all these things that are all mixed in together. But you can apply it to you know you can apply it to electronic music, and it works great. Okay. You know. No, I never. In my humble opinion. Yeah. But you know, I have a different way of looking at things. Right. <laughs> and then, well, you know, it's interesting because you said the producer often influences you know what you play. A lot of times, yeah. And you had multiple producers on this yeah. album. Yeah. But also that makes me think of the Grohl sessions. And, oh yeah. And I'm very curious when <coughs> when the producer is Dave Grohl, when the producer is a a noted drummer. Um, how did that change? Did that change how you played, or you know, how did you guys communicate? Did he have a more so working with a producer that is a drummer? Mm -hmm is a much different experience because they know how to understand better what I'm thinking when I play a certain thing a certain way going into this section or that section. Mm -hmm. So there were a few times where during the Grohl sessions where the idea was you know tossed around like hey let's not let let's do this drum beat here mm -hmm. and we had already played it a different way, and they want, you know, so like, we, hey, the drum beat you're doing at the end of the song, let's do that in the middle. And Dave, who had heard what I played, realized and knew bef what I was doing. He just instinctively knew, he said, no, 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 no. Hmm. Leave it right there where it is because it goes somewhere and it's building up. It's, he, he understood what I was going for, and he was able to say, hey, Chris, I want you to do. Take it, like do this here, do mm -hmm. that there, yeah. And he could talk to me in drummer speak, mm -hmm. and he wouldn't have to say a whole lot. He would just say, "Hey, man, can you do?" Ba -da -da -ba -da? And I'm like, "Okay, cool." <laughs> and I knew, you know, and yeah. it, even though it wasn't specifically a rhythm that he wanted, mm -hmm. I I understood. We we speak drums, yeah. You know, <laughs> he was at, by far um, working with Dave Grohl was probably one of the most enjoyable experiences. Um, I've ever had, you know, him as as a drummer, as a producer, as a human being. He's one of my favorite people on earth. Wow. Yeah, he's incredible. What makes him so good, in your opinion? He is a fan of music. Hmm. That's that's what make that's what makes Dave Grohl so great at what he does. Hmm. As a drummer, as a guitar player, as a singer, as a writer, as a producer, he's a fan of music. You want to know about DC Go Go music? Talk to Dave. Sounds like it wouldn't yeah. be a thing no. that that he would know a lot about, but he knows a lot about it. Okay. He's way into it. Wow. And then, you know, because I remember you talking about this at, at Rich Redmond's drum camp. By the way, if you get a chance, go to Rich Redmond's drum camp. It's, they're fabulous. You get to. They're a lot of fun. Yeah. You get, <laughs> I learned a lot. You get to hang with guys like Chris. Anyway, but I remember you talking about. The first day in that recording session, he took a chair and put it right in front of your kit and then just like hand, you know, chin on hand, just sat there. Oh, like, yeah. Was that intimidating? Was that like... No, oh, not at all. Okay. No, not at all. In fact, um, it was it was kind of funny, you know, it just it kind of made me giggle more than anything else. <laughs> um, you know, Dave's a, a fantastic drummer and he's... You know, a lot of people know him from having played with Nirvana yeah. and just where he was just brutalizing a drum kit. Mm -hmm. But the guy's got chops and serious chops, and he enjoys playing drums loud and with force, but that's, you know, that's how he enjoys to play. Mm -hmm. it, he's capable of a lot more than we see. And during those moments, he was, you know, I'm sitting around messing around trying to work out some really intricate ideas that I was just basically practicing while nothing was going on. Yeah, yeah. And you know, in that in that little moment where he was sitting in front of me, you know, he would stop me occasionally and be like, whoa, 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 stop, back up, what was that? <laughs> and I would show him what I was doing and he would go, okay, continue. <laughs> and I could see the wheels clicking in his head that, mm -hmm. that he was he was taking it all in and he was extracting what he knew he could use later on. Oh wow. And yeah. Okay. He's, a, he's a total student. It's, yeah. a, it's amazing. And then along the lines of that kind of dichotomy with, um, you know, the, the power drummer and, and, you know, smashing things, and but there being a little bit 
more subtlety that is possible. Um, <laughs> you you have a joking line where you say, you know, you describe your work as I hit things. Yeah, I totally ripped that from Vinnie Colliuta, I swear to God. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have a Vinnie Colliuta t-shirt that he was selling at one point on his website. It says, I, I hit things. It's me. This is what I do. I hit stuff. It's, you know, mm. it, people ask, you know, like, well, well, what do you do for a living? You're in a right. social situation. Oh, I hit stuff. Yeah, but the thing is... Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm noisy. I make, I make racket. That's what I do. Right, right. But... Uh, and if you're curious, uh, Vinny Caliuta, um, fantastic work on Sting's solo albums, if you want to go check and him Zappa out. Zappa and yeah. Herbie Hancock and anybody he wants to play with, he's amazing. Yeah. But I would drink a gallon of his bath water if I thought it would help <laughs> me play better. I swear to God. Wow. A, a, absolutely incredible drummer. I mean, mm -hmm. if, you, if, you can, if you're a drummer and you listen to Vinny play and you cannot get inspired then you really need to go back and figure out why it is that you're playing drums to begin with. Yeah. yeah. I mean, hands down, straight across the board. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've never had the pleasure of meeting him. Uh, hope to one day, maybe I'll buy him a cup of coffee and we'll talk about, yeah. you know, <laughs> we'll talk about stuff, not drums. I don't right. know. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, you know, it comes down to, oh, I hit things kind of thing, and, you know, and it's, it's part of a joke. But um, when I saw you do uh, Rich Rendon's drum camp when I've seen video footage of you doing clinics when you start to play inevitably you're not bashing away you start with something very soft very subtle um, you know creating more of an easygoing kind of mood um yeah well a lot of that has to do with that that you know that organic curve of, of dynamics and energy and intent mm -hmm. and you know a, a journey doesn't necessarily always start full throttle you mm -hmm. know what I mean sometimes it does yeah but not always and I'm a big fan of a uh, big fan of like all the jazz greats you know Max Roach um, an amazing soloist and his 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 drum solos took a journey you know you went on a on a journey and you would start with these beautiful little ideas that were melodic mm. and they weren't just rhythmic and uh, Terry Bozio is another just incredibly insanely talented yeah. individual also played with Frank Zappa <laughs> um, you know he does the same thing he'll he'll do these solos these very expansive solos on that enormous drum kit yeah um, but he'll he'll do things that start out subtly, mm -hmm. and it's almost a way of taking everybody in the room and gathering them in and saying, "Okay, here we go. Here's where we are." And not that I have the 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 ability to draw an audience in that way, but for those who want to listen yeah. and want to take a journey with me while I'm doing that, and certainly and that's what I'm, you know, I enjoy right. doing it. Now you know, I let the ideas happen. I like I don't sit down. If I can help it, mm -hmm. if it's up to me, I don't sit down with a preconceived notion of what I'm going to play on a drum solo, open drum solo like that. Yeah. So a clinic situation, I'll just start playing whatever idea pops out first, boop, and that's what I start with, mm -hmm. and then it goes from there. Yeah. But and actually, you've you've cleared up a, a years long mystery for me because uh, uh, decades ago I, I did an interview with Billy Cobham. Oh. And um, he said, he said, when I when I'm playing something, I was. He said, I look at it as I'm writing a letter to someone. And to be honest, I never fully got what he was talking about what until a, now. What a beautiful way of putting that. Right, but I wow. didn't get it until you explained. Wow. Yeah, you know, and it's like, okay, now I understand what he was talking about. Yeah. That, so. Yeah. Well, I, I'm I'm sure no one really writes a lot. I don't know. With, with like all caps texting these days where you're right, yelling right. at somebody, I guess you could start out full throttle, but you know, but when you're writing an actual letter, I mean, you really want to take your time and yeah, you know, and you say start what you're off say. subtly and then build to a different idea yeah. and then why not? Yeah, so okay, so that that clears that up. Who knows? Um, now. Another thing I'm curious because I, I did read about you know how you were heavily influenced by you know all these jazz greats, um, which what I'm curious about is how did that benefit you being in this band? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, 
So my love for jazz, I, when I was 16, I would hang out in these jazz clubs in Birmingham mm -hmm. where I grew up. And I would ask all the seasoned freelance jazz drummers in town for, for tips and pointers. And I, I remember one specific guy uh, who was always this wealth of snarky knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would ask him for tips and pointers, and he would give him, he would give them to me in this like really sort of yeah whatever kid here, and he'd like toss it out like yeah. he would say never practice when you play and never play when you practice that kind of stuff I've you know that, yeah. which is brilliant by the way, mm -hmm. um, but I asked him for a, a a really good strong I said man you know I want to be a working drummer one day, what's the best advice you can give me, and he said learn how to hear form through changes. And, mm -hmm. and if you're a jazzer, then what that means is, what, what he really meant was be able to discern what part of the song you're in by listening to the changes, to the chord changes in the background. So if you're a jazzer and you know what a three, six, two, five, one turnaround is, it's a certain chord progression that gets you from, you know, mm -hmm. back to the top of the form, okay. you know, usually at the end of the, the whole form of the song. Mm -hmm. And so I learned how to hear form, song form in that sort of weird way. Yeah. And this was before I even left for college. And then I go to college and blah, blah, blah. It's a whole other talk show. <laughs> but um, so I, how that helps me is like when we're learning new songs, new material, mm -hmm. and we're trying to come up with new material that we're writing, if we're learning covers, whatever the, the situation may be, we, I try to hear things in form. Hmm. So... Yeah, the time signature may, like Uncaged, perfect example, one of our tunes, right? I hear that, that you know, the verses where the time gets really janky. Uh-huh, yeah. You know, and I can explain it all out for you, and, and will if you, if you want me to, but it's really just, it's really just four bars of 4-4. Four, four. That's it. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. It sounds like more. It is. It is. <laughs> so it, it's two time signatures being played exactly the same time uh, because when we wrote that song, Zach wanted, he wanted the form of the song to follow the, ver the, the spoken lyrics, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But he wanted that guitar part to be there. Yeah. And the guitar part, so that's what I'm doing, kick and snare, I'm following the guitar part. My hi-hat is guiding the four bars of 4-4. Four, four. Okay. So it's playing quarter notes that like, it sounds like I'm flipping the time back and forth and in actuality, it's four bars of 7-8 and one bar of 2-4. You do the math, it comes up to four bars of 4-4. Four, four. Okay, okay, yeah. I would think, and, and then it also makes me think of, uh, again, because I was just listening to it uh, from the Grohl Sessions, Get the Grohl Sessions, by the way, it didn't get the attention it deserved. It's, a, <laughs> it's, a, it's an awesome EP. Um, but there's the song Let It Rain, where now you know. Dave actually played drums on that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Dave actually played drums on that. I, it was really funny. Like that whole situation was. He wanted to play drums on one of the tracks, and I was more than happy to let him mm -hmm. play. And that was the one he, he chose. Now that same week, the guys went and performed at the CMA Awards in Nashville, and they wanted Dave to perform and, and with them. Yeah. Uh, and he said. Well, only if I get to play drums. And they said, everybody just looked at me, and I'm like, I'm cool. Like, I'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll cheer you on from home, man. It'll be great. It'll be awesome. And so the, the, the really interesting sort of, the, the, to me, it was kind of comical and funny, was yeah. Dave had to learn all of my parts from Day for the Dead, <laughs> which is the song they played on CMA Awards. Mm -hmm. And then I had to turn around literally and learn all of his drum parts from Let It Rain <laughs> <laughs> to be played out on, on the live tour, so. Wow. Yeah, and so like, but there again, like getting back to how I hear song form mm -hmm. in, that, in that crazy solo section, like you get down and you start doing all the odd meter math, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a sequence, and what I heard was the sequence and how to play time through that, through the elongated form, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? Which, yeah. it, as I recall is, I think it's, I think the sequence is 11, 9, 14, 11, 9, 15. Oh, okay. 
Or it might be, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. So it's a bar of 11.8, a bar of 9.8, a bar of 14.8, right? Or 7.4, but it works mm -hmm. out better if you count 14. Yeah. That way you don't have to, you know, change anything in your brain. <laughs> and then 11, 9, and 15. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the result is fabulous, and it flows. Yeah. You know, see, but Dave thought about it from a totally different perspective. Mm -hmm. In this, in the studio, he was thinking, of, he was keying off the guitar part, you know, which is da 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 You know, so he's he's hearing the guitar the guitar part, and that's what he was keying off of. Okay. You know. Yeah. I'm listening to the the longer sort of expanse. Mm hmm Yeah. And that's sort of how I base my musical choices. Hmm. You know. Okay. It's really, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting way of demonstrating two drummers playing the same material, but approaching it from two totally different yeah. starting points, but achieving the same effect on the end. You know? oh. oh, that's a really great point. That is great. Um, and then just to switch things a little, um, you're also very great at talking to up-and-coming musicians and stuff about kind of having the right attitude and having, you know, to, to either make it in the business or just to be a professional musician. And there's, there's check out his website, actually. There's a, he has great information on his website. Um, but I remember you telling the story about when you were first hired by Zach. And, you know, he said he was going to bring you on. And you asked him, I think it was three questions. Oh, yeah. And three very specific questions. Yeah, but they weren't the questions that I would have assumed someone would have asked. So, number one, can you go back through what those questions were? So, when he's, all right, you're the guy, because it, it was an audition process. Yeah. And it was me and a bunch of other guys. We were all invited to go and audition, and and um, then I ended up getting the gig, and he calls me and says, all right, you're our guy. We want you to be in the band. And I said, okay, great. Can you keep me busy? That was question one, because mm -hmm. I want to I wanna work a lot. I want to play a lot and he kind of giggled a little bit and said yeah I, I think I can keep you busy mm -hmm. I said great second question can you pay me a little something so that I can be at my bills paid I have financial responsibilities and I can't do this for free and he said yeah I think we can pay you a little something and then I said third question what time's the bus leave <laughs> that's it that's all I needed to know can mm -hmm. you keep me busy you know it it, it and by finding out the answers to those, like it was finding out, A, the, the, the first question, how much commitment am I going to have to, to put in on this? Okay. You know, how much, how much is, uh, of my time is this going to take up? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. So, and I had asked that question of band leaders before, you know. Um, hey, you know, like, can you keep me busy? And, and if they go, ah, you know, it's like, it's not not really like super busy, then that lets me know like, because I'd come from, a, a, I've been freelancing for 20 years, you know? Mm, yeah. And, uh, and you know, you hear somebody go, ah, well, not, not, not too busy. Then you know that like, yeah, they're good for a you know, few, few gigs a month. Yeah, yeah. You could juggle the schedule a little bit and, and you're fine. Right. You know, can you pay me? If, you know, yeah, I think we can pay you. Well, that, that lets me know that I'm not going to be working for, you know, 20 bucks and a slice of pizza. Yeah. You know. But I mean, even that. Like, Which I've done it, that. I've I, I literally <laughs> I've worked for forty bucks on a cheeseburger before right. for two years, and that's how, at part in part how I ended up getting the gig. Right, and then and didn't you have to like drive hundred miles to get to? The, it was one hundred and eighty-seven miles. <laughs> just to get one paid way forty dollars in a cheeseburger to to play some of the best blues music. It was so much fun, and I I did it because I loved who I was playing the music with, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. 40 bucks and a cheeseburger. Yeah. But it seems like a lot of guys would go, all right, how much can you pay me? You know, can you meet my price? But you came in and I just kind of, can, <coughs> can I pay my bills? Yeah. I mean, I don't, you know, you don't, it depends on what you're trying to get out of it. You know, like if mm -hmm. I go, you know, you're like me going in for two years and, and doing a blues gig with some guys for basically 40 bucks and a free meal and having to drive 187 miles one way to do the gig. Yeah. You know, that's you know, that's barely breaking even once you take a, the 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 mileage off on your vehicle, you know. Mm -hmm. Um 
I, I wasn't doing it for money. I wasn't doing it for anything other than feeding my soul. Because at, at the root of it all, I'm a musician. Mm -hmm. It's what I do. And I want to make music with other musicians and other like-minded people. And, you know, if you do it for money, you're sunk out of the gate. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> the reality is there are not that many super big, huge gigs out there. Right. Compared to the number of drummers there are uh, available to do them. Yeah. You know, and, and so if you're in it for the money and, and fame and all that other fun stuff, you might just you might be disappointed mm -hmm. but if you do it because you love to do it and you would do it for free then you know you might be a lot happier and then when things pan out if they do it's icing on the cake you know <laughs> it's gravy on the potatoes baby yeah <laughs> well that makes me wonder though i mean how does one do it so they don't get taken advantage of i mean because there's lots of guys that play for the passion and and they'll do some horrendous gigs and people will take advantage like oh well you know we can't pay you but it'll be great exposure you know that kind of stuff well I think you, you in my opinion you, you kind of have to just figure that out everyone has their limit everyone has their line mm -hmm. right so you know for me it was making sure that I got I didn't have to pay anything for gas and I didn't have to you know buy food yeah you know so that as long as I'm breaking even in that regard mm -hmm. I'll go play you know I used to tell people all the time I play for free but getting me to move my gear is expensive <laughs> you know yeah it's, it's just the long and short of it I mean I, I love to play I love to make music and it didn't when I was freelancing in Birmingham I would play anything mm -hmm. you know didn't matter I was doing like a singer-songwriter thing on a Tuesday night for 20 bucks and you mm. know it's kick drum snare drum tambourine mm. you know sometimes yeah. not even the snare drum you, oh. know? <laughs> you know and just like set the tambourine up with a head on you know a headed yeah. tambourine and play that you know kind of like you, a pandero you know it's like yeah. and you loved that just as much as like a, a that full cavalier game. approach to making a living as a musician really works for me and worked for me then you know mm -hmm. you know I would tell guys around town hey let me sub for you let me call. You've got a steady gig. I don't want to steal your gig, but you've got a wife and kids, and life is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Call me when life happens. Hmm. Let me let me cover for you for a night. Mm -hmm. You you'd be surprised how much work I got and stayed busy with just doing that. And and how much of the motivation for that was altruistic versus this will give me a chance to play something different than I normally play or play with people I haven't played with before. Well, I mean, certainly that's a factor. But, I mean, the altruistic side of it was, for me, was just getting to play. Hmm. You know, I'll play 10 hours of polka music nonstop. <laughs> you know, if, that mean, if that's the only gig I'm going to get for a while, then I'll yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's about being able to play and express. And, you know, some people go, oh, man, it's a, it's a boring wedding gig. You can do a lot in a boring wedding gig because nobody's really paying attention sometimes. <laughs> and if that's the gig, mm -hmm. you know, if you're just wallpaper, yeah. uh, sonically speaking, and no one's really paying attention, not that you should practice when you play, but maybe that's the time you start trying out some subtle things on the hi-hat that maybe nobody notices, mm -hmm. but you know you're doing it. Yeah. And you're keeping it interesting for yourself. You mm -hmm. know, I played for, uh, there was a chunk of time I literally... I played, every gig I did was a wedding band, and we played over and over and over and over, and, and weddings after wedding after wedding after wedding. And to fix my boredom, mm -hmm. I set up my drum kit left-handed. Oh, my God. And played traditional grip left-handed. Oh, my God, that sounds impossibly hard. It was impossibly hard. It was very <laughs> difficult. But what it made me do was it made me simplify what I was thinking, mm -hmm. and I had to play with intent. And I was no longer worried about whether or not this groove was happening a certain way or I, I was no longer hyper-focusing on what everybody else was doing. I was hyper-focusing on trying to keep decent time and play decent fills. Mm -hmm. You know, we were wallpaper for 90% of the time. Yeah. You know, and when you're in a wallpaper situation, the altruistic side of me is like, let's learn something. 
let's figure out how to turn this boring musical scenario into a learning experience. Hmm. And then another bit of great advice that I got from reading through some of your materials online is you had a line about, it was something along the lines of if you don't define success for yourself, you're, you're pretty much oh. lost. It's, well, it's true. <coughs> I mean, pardon me. It, it, in order to achieve anything, you have to set a goal, right? And so to just say, oh, I want to be successful, well, successful at what? You know, it doesn't matter. You can apply this to anything mm -hmm. and not just drumming or, or music. You, you have to set a goal. You have to define what it means to be successful. And, and I'm, this, is, you know, this is probably the, my biggest soapbox I always get on, especially with young musicians. Mm -hmm. You know, people will come up and ask me all the time, what's it like to finally be a successful musician? And I tell them I've been a successful musician since I was about 17 years old. Mm -hmm. And they go, well, I've never heard of you before, you know, Zach Brown Band. And it's because my definition of success and their definition of success are two totally different things. I've always defined success very clearly and concisely as at the end of my tax forms every year, there's a box where you sign your name and to the right of that box, mm -hmm. there's a box that says occupation. For me, it's always been, success has been clearly defined as writing the word musician in that box, right? Mm -hmm. so, so since I was much, much younger than I am now, I have been successful because the bulk of my living has come from making music. Mm -hmm. That's all it was. Everything else to me didn't matter. Yeah, but that makes me wonder because I think the other good, it's good to have goals. Yeah. And, you know, and that's, I think that's part of defining success is like, all right, I want to expand a bit, I want to reach a bit, I want to go a little bit beyond. Yeah. Now that you're at this particular level, what is your new goal or new definition of success that you're trying to reach? Um, well, I'm still trying to maintain the, the what I've always had going along, you know, so I, I don't want to ever not make my living making music, you know, mm -hmm. like to, not that there's anything bad about making a living any other way, it's just for me, I know that I'm successful when I've written the, the word musician in that box. Mm -hmm. um, but moving beyond where I am now, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question you pose because one day I woke up and realized, I, I walked through this one particular room in my house where I, I, I keep things that, I call it the trophy room, okay. you know, and I, and I keep a lot of things that, that are markers of accomplishment in this career, mm. right? So it's, it's a room that I keep ACM award and and Grammy awards and gold records and platinum records hanging on the wall and I rarely go into this room and I walked into this room this one particular morning and I thought to myself wow now what because I had ticked off everything that I had said whimsically <laughs> as, a, as a teenager you know yeah. like, you, you know like what do you want to do with your life oh I'm gonna win a Grammy one day well right. okay check you yeah, know right you, there's like this weird thing that happened to me where I went, well, okay, now what? I have achieved everything that I had said I, I had hoped to achieve. Yeah. You know, now what do I do to move on? Well, all I can do beyond that is to be the best drummer that I can be. So I continue to try to learn, uh, try to learn new skill sets so that I can apply what I already know as a drummer to other aspects. So like learn to be a better teacher Hmm. Learn to be uh, a record producer, uh, you know, and be better at that. Mm -hmm. um, and then also learn to be a better, you know, a better husband, a better human being, a better, a better person, mm -hmm. you know. So that, in in the small sort of, these are the goals that I set for myself. Yeah. But as far as being successful, I mean, I am successful. I'm blessed to be very successful, mm -hmm. and and as I choose to define it. You know, yeah, it's different for you, different for you, different for everybody. Yeah, you know, but I think it's important. You know, I used to tell people all the time, 
you know, you want to be a rock star, go be a rock star. Buy some, you know, buy some funky clothes and, you know, right. and act like a rock star. You'll be a rock star. Yeah. That's it. You know, oh, but I want to, you know, okay, well, then clearly define what it is that you want and go do that. Go, go be that. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to drive, you know, you want to be, you know, want to be rich and famous? Well, that's great. Rich and famous for what? Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. That's a cool lofty, you know, that's a cool goal. It's a cool dream, but famous for what? Mm. Yeah. These are the questions that burn in my mind when I lay, <laughs> lay awake at night. Well, along these lines, one more. Any, any, anything. Ask okay. away. Well, just to keep going down this road. Okay. Because, you know, you, it, you had written uh, on your website that the decision to be a working musician can lead to some difficult choices. Oh, yeah. I'm curious, what are some of the difficult choices so, you've had? All right. Make? So, for example, um, I think if you're going to become a working musician, you have to be a bit of a realist. Hmm. Now, it's great to be, because to, it, it's, the, it's the lofty dream that's going to, propel you through the rough times you know the it's the daydream of oh man i'm gonna be gonna be this this big time musician and yeah. i'm gonna be in a huge stage in front of thousands and thousands of people like that lofty dream is what propels you and gives you energy and gives you drive through the tough times mm -hmm. but the reality is even in the good times you know the reality is it's a tough life to live you know, a freelance musician, it doesn't matter which city you're in, you've got bills to pay, right? Mm -hmm. You've got gear to maintain. You've got to be able to get to and from the gig, which means you've got to have a ride of some description or a way to get your gear there. Yeah. If you live in New York City, a lot of clubs might have a, a house kit. You know, you live in Nashville, they have a house kit in a lot of clubs, you know. But you never know what you're walking into. Yeah, I was going to say, you that's know. probably a pretty well-worked-over kit. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so the reality is that you've got to be able to get to and from the gig. You've got to feed yourself. You've got to keep yourself kind of healthy. You've got to uh, you got to be able to practice your craft, you know, which means your chances are you're either going to have a rental space to rehearse in or you've got your your paying for a really groovy place to live where it's cool to do that, where you don't have a lot of neighbors yeah. who are going to complain. Um, these are the realities. And, and so you have to accept those realities. And you have to make some difficult choices along the way. I knew, for me, difficult choice number one, I wasn't going to be living in a really fancy house in a really fancy neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, with a gate and a guard and, and a, you know, right. a, a clubhouse and a golf course. I knew that that was not in the cards for me. Um, I knew that driving a fancy car was not in the cards for me. Driving a minivan was. Yeah. You know, because <laughs> they're affordable and you can take the seats out and you can put lots of gear in the back. Yeah. You know, and they get great gas mileage. I mean, um, but these are these are the, the tough choices you make, you know. Yeah. Do I, do I spend money on a really fancy gift for my girlfriend and or wife you know, well, maybe not and wife, but like, you know. <laughs> but you, for some, for some, sadly, you know, hey, no yes. judgment, just right. no judgment. But, but like, do you, do you spend the extra money on your girl, uh, or do you spend that money on reheading the drum kit because you got some big gigs coming up? Mm -hmm. You crack the cymbal. Do you spend money? You know, do you do you spend money to replace the cymbal, or do you spend that money on rent? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like you, you have to make those difficult choices all the time. Um, that's the reality. Yeah. And that's the part that they don't teach you in rock and roll school. <laughs> you know what I mean? They don't teach you about, hey, yeah. man, you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to plan ahead for taxes. You know? Yeah. You want to save money, you know, save your money. Don't get into debt. Um, don't buy anything on credit. If you can help it, don't do it, you know? Yeah, yeah, right. It's because it's, these are things that prevent you from being able to accomplish the goals you want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Is there any regret that came from that? Or was it all, okay, this is in line with what I want to do and what my idea of success is. And so... I, you know what? No... The, the only regret 
in that regard is that I had to at times be somewhat selfish. Hmm. In what way? In, in in that I had to be I had to be mindful of my goals and where I was trying to go and what I was trying to accomplish. And along the way, people might have gotten hurt or had a perception that they were being hurt. Hmm. You know, because of my inaction. Hmm. You know what I mean? Stay the path. I mean, just the, the reality of life is that we get married and we have kids and we have a house payment, we have a car payment, and you got to save for school for your kids and there's like medical bills and you've got, yeah. this is reality. This is life. Right. This is real life. I didn't get married for the first time until late, didn't have any kids. Um, these were things that in part conscious choices, in part just kind of how it worked out, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you know, buying a house was a difficult thing, you yeah. know, uh, because you, as a freelance musician, you don't you don't have a W two form that you know you, you from your employer yeah. that says we've been withholding this amount of money you know right you don't have that you you know you're ten ninety nine to uh, or paid in cash you know like mm -hmm. it's very difficult to prove your income you can do it everybody can survive and make it yeah you know I made a living in Birmingham Alabama mm -hmm. you know where it was it was tough to be a working musician mm. but I made a living doing it you know okay and then. All right, so then what's the difference between you who encountered all those hurdles and stuck with it and the guy who encounters those hurdles and goes, well, all right, maybe I'll, I'll turn off and get a corporate gig and just to... It, you have to want it. You have to want it in your heart. You really, truly do. I've always jokingly said that the road is the great equalizer. If you load up all your stuff and get in a 15 passenger van and you go trekking across the country to go play a gig in the middle of nowhere, you know, at some crazy cinder block shack <laughs> for a bucket of wings and gas money, mm -hmm. like that will break you if you're not, if your heart's not truly in it. Yeah. You will jump ship so fast. I've seen it happen a gazillion times. Really talented and gifted musicians get out on the road and the reality of the lifestyle hits them. Mm. And next thing you know, they're, you know, they're selling all their gear and going to work at, at a bank or an insurance company, and, but it's, it's what they choose to do. Yeah. Because their definition of success is slightly different. Mm. You know? It doesn't make, them, make anybody any better or any worse, it's just it's the choices that they make. And you have to, you kinda, we're all gonna live with these choices that we make along the way, but mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a good question. I mean, it's a it's a, the road is the great equalizer for sure, and the the people that don't tough it out, maybe they don't really truly want to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, because we're all human. We're not we're all going to do only what we really want to do. Yeah. If things don't sit well with us for one reason or another, we typically, as human beings turn away from it. We get it rid of it. You know, we don't want to have that in our lives. Mm -hmm. You know, you, yeah. can, you, you can do that from like a, a job, whether it be a corporate job or a non-corporate job or whatever job it is, you know, a job, relationships, when things are not bad, you, you know, when, when things are great and you're feeling good about it, you're, you're, you're in it hundred percent, you know, but then if things start getting kind of, eh, and you feel you feel bad in your soul every morning when you wake up. Yeah. We as human beings figure out how to rid ourselves of those things. And so for the people who give it a shot at being a musician and it doesn't work out for one reason or another, maybe it's not what they truly want to be doing. Hmm. You know, it doesn't mean they're bad people or bad musicians. It just means that maybe their heart was somewhere else, you know. Some guys have kids, they, you know, they get married, they have kids, and then, you know, they quit playing and they, they go be dads, mm -hmm. you know, and that's where their heart is at. Yeah. And that's where they feel successful, is that they've become the best dads on planet Earth, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's a tough gig. Yeah. You know? Right. Yeah. All right. 
Cool. I think it's a really good point to end on, you know? Yeah. Be happy. Be good to one another. Mm -hmm. Be kind. <laughs> These are the things you really need to take away from this interview. Right? <laughs>